preacher. The preacher needs some prayer this morning because the preacher was up really late last night unintentionally. My mom's evening caretaker didn't show up. And we had a little scrabbling going on to try to fill that position. So I was up until about 1 o'clock. I'm usually in bed at 8.30 on Saturday night, so I'm operating on half a tank this morning, so I need some prayer. Anybody in the mood to pray for me today? Okay, here comes Alexa. Thank you, dear. Alexa is someone who prays for me every day. I know that. Thank you, Lord, for gathering in this place to worship you together. Thank you for Pastor Terry, who you've brought here to lead us. Please bless all of us today to open our hearts to receive a message that you have for us. Bless Terry as she as you speak to her as well as through her and let all things in this time work together to bring us closer to you. In the name of your son, Jesus, amen. Thank you so much. Y'all know I grew up in this area, right? I went to Cockeysville Junior High School and then Delaney High School. And when I was in the 10th grade, there were so many of us because we're baby boomers that half the 10th grade class was at Cockeysville. I was there. To get out of the 10th grade in those days, you had to be able to recite Mark Antony's soliloquy from Julius Caesar. Wait until the last day, the last, the last period of the day. Buses were pulling out, so I did it very quickly. I got it out in about a minute and a half. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar not to praise him. The evil that men do live after them, the good is often turned with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. That's all I remember, but that's an important part, right? The evil that men do live after them, the good is often turned with their bones, meaning the bad stuff you do, people remember. The good stuff you do often gets buried with you in your grave. How many of you think that's the way it is? Do you remember the good people do or the bad people do? The good? Then why do we call Thomas Doubting Thomas? Doubting Thomas, right? If I say Thomas, you say, oh, Doubting Thomas, I know him. Thomas is one of the few disciples that we actually get to hear speak in Scripture. He speaks three times in John's Gospel. The first time in the 11th chapter when Jesus has waited to go to his friend Lazarus, to heal him, he's sick. This wasn't just an acquaintance, this was one of Jesus' closest friends. His sister sent word that he's gonna die if he doesn't come. Jesus waits to go and then tells the disciples, Lazarus is asleep, and they said, well then he'll get better. And they said, no, I mean, he's dead. And finally, Jesus goes, but they don't want him to go because if he goes to Bethany, which is close to Jerusalem, they're afraid he's gonna be stoned to death afraid because people have already put in place the plots to kill him. Thomas is the one who stands up and says, what? Do y'all know what Thomas says then? Oh, no. You only know about the doubting part, right? Thomas says, then let us go and die with him. That is not what a wimpy guy says, is it at all? Pretty bold statement for someone who is known as the doubter. Well, then Thomas again gets to speak out when Jesus is at the Last Supper with his disciples in John's Gospel. Not Holy Communion in that case. What does Jesus do at his last meal with his disciples in John's Gospel? Washes their feet. Washes their feet. And as they're sitting there, Jesus says to them, you know where I'm going and you know how to get there. You know the way, right? And Thomas says what everybody else is thinking. Thomas has the nerve to say to Jesus. He says, I don't know what you're talking about, Lord. Where are you going? How can we know? Where, if we don't know where you're going, how do we know how to get there? And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So we have Thomas again being bold when other people are afraid to speak out. Then we have Easter evening. Because this is a two-part story. One that happened last Sunday when the church was full. And one that happens this Sunday when the church is not quite as full, right? But the disciples are where? These are men who have heard that morning 
from the women, what do they hear? The women run to them and say what? He is risen. We've seen the Lord. And they say, go lie down, honey. Go calm down. Now this is what biblical scholar and bishop of the Anglican Church, N.T. Wright, says is a good reason to believe that you know the story is true because they had women testify to the fact that they'd seen Jesus. He said if they'd had time for a better story, they would have made one up. Women were not allowed to testify in a court proceeding because they were considered unreliable witnesses. Right, ladies? We're all hysterical, aren't we, all the time? So women were not allowed to testify. The women said to the disciples, the women who were there, while the disciples were off hiding, the women were there, ready to anoint his body for a proper burial. And he appears to them, and they go, and he says, go tell my disciples. And they run off, and they tell them, and they said, I doubt that. They don't say it in those words, but it's, isn't that what their actions say? We doubt it, because where are they? They're hiding in a locked room. And who shows up in their locked room? Jesus. How did he get in? Does anybody know? I don't know, but he's there, isn't he? And what does he say to them? Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace, I've said before, it's not just peace like the absence of warfare. Shalom means wholeness, completeness, fulfillment of everything. Jesus says, peace be with you. And then he shows them his hands and his side. They don't have to ask for it. They see it, and then he's gone, and Thomas shows up. Where was Thomas this whole time while they were locked away? He's in the world. We don't know what he was doing out there. He may have been doing reconnaissance work to see what was being said about them. He may have been in disguise. He may have had a different shawl over his head. He may have been out listening what the plot was to find these followers of Jesus and do away with them to end this story about his resurrection once and for all. He may have been listening to the rumors about this resurrection because people had started to talk, hadn't they? Cleopas on the road to Damascus and his companion had said, we hoped he had been the one, and Jesus shows up and says to them, what you talking about, guys? And they said, are you the only person in Jerusalem who doesn't know what has happened? So people are talking at this point about what has happened with Jesus, whether they think they moved his body and hid it away or whether he has been raised as he said. But his disciples are scared of the Jews, and they're hiding in a locked room does not stop Jesus. Thomas, on the other hand, maybe he's not getting dinner for everybody. It was before Uber Eats and all those things. No DoorDash in those days, so maybe he's not getting food, but he's out in the world, right? Again, not something that a wimpy guy would do. But what does he say when they say to him, we've seen the Lord, we've seen the Lord. Just like they had said to the women when they said, we've seen the Lord, he says, I'm not going to believe this, uh-uh. Unless I see that porcupine flying myself without a green screen, without people dressed in green, I'm not going to believe that porcupines can fly. I don't believe this Jesus business. And then Jesus is there with him again. How does he get in the locked room? We don't know. But he goes to Thomas and he says, here I am, touch me. Touch my hand, touch my side. We don't know that Thomas really did it, do we? Because it doesn't say he touched him, but any time you see artwork, from that time forward, what do you see? Thomas with his hand inside Jesus' wound on his side. You see him putting his hand inside this flesh, touching him. So what does this tell us about Jesus and Thomas? I don't think it says much about Thomas's doubt, but it says that Jesus will meet you wherever you are on the road, whether it's the road to Damascus or the road to faith. Jesus will meet you where you are. He doesn't have to have you have this great faith. He comes to you where you are and says, here I am, peace be with you. And he breathes on them and they receive the Holy Spirit from him. Now if I had been Jesus, I would have said, what happened to you boys? Where'd you go that night in that garden? I asked you to stay awake and you just took off like a bunch of cowards. I would have been chewing them out a little bit, I think, if I had been the Lord. Which is a good thing I'm not the Lord, right? You can say, okay, good thing, Pastor Terry, because Jesus doesn't judge them. He doesn't hold them accountable. He breathes the Holy Spirit into them and says, peace be with you, fullness, completeness, accomplishment. It's all done. And he loves them because that's who he is. And Thomas, he shows him what he needs to see because Thomas, it wasn't that he doubted Jesus. He needed to experience what the others had experienced. So many people need to experience what we've experienced, haven't they? They're not going to experience it if we never share it with them. We don't share our stories of doubt 
because I think, that's why I call the sermon what I did, Blessed with the Doubters, because Thomas certainly was blessed by Jesus, wasn't he? Because doubt can lead to truer faith. It can lead to deeper faith. There was a kid at Harmony Church where I served last before coming here named Nathan. Nathan was kind of the goof of the youth group. You know, you got some kids that are just goofy. We did a game on their confirmation retreat the year Nathan came into church membership where we had a game where somebody said, if you believe this, go to this wall. If you believe this, go to this wall. If you believe in the middle, go to this middle. Something about, you know, do you believe that Jesus really was raised from the dead? Most kids are on the doubting side or in the middle somewhere. Nathan was kissing that wall that said he believed it fully. And I was like, wow, Nathan, what made you believe it so strongly? And he said, my mother told me and she's never lied to me. That's what he said. That's all it took for him because his mother had never lied to him. And he said, you wouldn't lie to me either, would you, Pastor Terry? And I said, no, actually I wouldn't. And some of the kids moved a little closer to Nathan then. I wish I had that kind of faith that just somebody said that to me and I know it then and there. My faith had me all over the place through the years of my life. I can tell you Jesus came to me wherever I was, whether it was my strongest moment of belief or my weakest moment of doubt. Jesus found me where I was and spoke to me there and met me on the road and took me farther along with him. That's all we can say about this passage other than doubting Thomas. Don't call him doubting Thomas. Call him valiant Thomas, strong Thomas. Thomas, who was the one, the first person ever to proclaim what about Jesus? What does he say when he sees him? He doesn't even have to touch him, but he sees him. And what does he say? My Lord and my God. They don't call him God. They call him Son of God. Thomas recognizes in that moment who this is in the fullness of Christ. That This is God, fully human and fully divine. Because here's Jesus again, this very visceral guy saying, stick your hand in here if you need to touch. Touch my wounds. Because he still has that body. He's still the incarnation of God in a way we can understand and touch and feel and love and be loved by because we know that he has experienced everything we have and yet has remained faithful to God. Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Jesus, through the Holy Spirit coming into them, is giving them the ability to do what he did from the cross, which is to forgive others. Oh, but we don't like to do that, do we? We don't like to forgive anybody. We like to hold on and nurse our grudges. Trust me, I know. So where will you be on your road this Easter? It's been a week. We're like the disciples gathered to get in the house. But we know they're going to leave. Do you know what happened to Thomas after the scriptures that we have end? Do you know what, where Thomas ended up spending his life? His ministry, India. India. We tend to think that anything Western in India, like religion, came from us. The white folks took it there, but no. Thomas went there at about the year 50 AD and lived there until he was killed in 72 AD. As all the other disciples would be killed, they went from being in this room locked away scared of the Jews to taking the message of Jesus Christ into the world where each and every one of them was martyred. Thomas run through by a spear. Peter hanged on a cross upside down. Others with their heads removed. They didn't care because once Jesus gave them the Holy Spirit, they didn't care what happened to them. They knew that they would be all right because what started out as doubt became a deep and abiding faith. So don't be afraid to doubt. I do premarital counseling and I say to folks, tell me what was, what was like the last time we disagreed about anything. And a couple say to me, we never disagree about anything. I'm like, yeah, right. Right, you never disagree about anything. Don't lie to me in my office. And they're like, well, we do disagree a little bit, but we never fight. Well, all a disagreement is is a difference of opinions and you don't have to let a disagreement become a fight. But how many of you have ever been mad at the people you live in the house with? Maybe you ever lived with a husband or a wife or a child? Don't tell me it's just happy all the time. If you have a real relationship with anybody, you can struggle against them, you can brush up against them, you can even wrestle with them sometimes. Figuratively, not literally, boys and girls. But your relationship gets deeper the more you question it sometimes, doesn't it? Because that's when you prove it, and that's when it becomes real for you. 
So don't be afraid of your doubt, but let your doubt take you deeper into your faith. Unless you're like my pal Nathan, who believes if his mom told him and Pastor Terry would never lie to him. And I would never lie to you either. I hope you know that. It's all right to doubt, to struggle, as long as it brings you closer to God, and it will. So blessed are the doubters. They're blessed because Jesus will meet you where you are, and he loves you enough not to leave you there. Amen, amen, amen.